Well, hello everybody, it's Friday, April 24th. This is um, episode number six of the uh, viral vlog. And um, not quite sure exactly what we're gonna do this week. I'm kinda gonna improvise. Um, gonna try to get back to the roots of viral vlog a little bit and not make so many edits and just kinda go one, two, three, uh, what do they call that? <laughs> um, Gonzo journalism. <laughs> so um, we're gonna go. We're gonna go totally um, Fonzo. We're gonna be like the Fonz, um, and we're just gonna um, yeah, maybe play a song, see what Mandy's up to. Um, I'm out here with the cube, uh, and um, yeah, maybe we'll maybe we'll take a trip. In there. Say hello, cube. Say hello. All right. Okay, so I'm back in the kitchen now, and um, I'm gonna pour myself an entire elephant full of coffee. And um, I had an idea to show off this um, John Bartram's um, embroidery, that's a Franklinia flower. And um, one time as a present for Mandy, I commissioned somebody to make this um, embroidered version of the Franklinia flower. Uh, there's a local place I, I pass and I'd always see they, they would do, um, for Masonic groups and stuff, little embroidered back patches and things, and I thought, wow, what if I did something like that? So, um, that's the Franklinia flower. Mandy works at Bartram's Garden in Philly, the uh, historic garden. She can tell you more about it. Yeah, well, actually, the drawing that you showed here is by William Bartram, the son, oh, see? one of the sons of John Bartram. I already messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> and he was the artist in the family. That's right. Yeah. John Bartram was more of a square. Well, he was a weirdo, but... um. But he, and he was just mad for the Franklinia and kept telling his son to go down there and get some more. Mm. Um, so tell us about the Franklinia. Franklinia seeds. So they found a little group of the trees growing in the... Who found them? Um, John and William, while they were traveling around down there, speculating land and stuff for Europeans. Where at? Um, Georgia, what is now Georgia, the Creek Muskegee Territory. Um, and, uh, they, the Alatamaha River Basin is where they saw it for the first time, and there was some little groups of the trees, and they were really beautiful, and had, um, beautiful flowers, but they kept having to go back several times in order to find flowers, I mean seeds, that were ripe, but finally, um, William did manage to collect some ripe seed and send them back to his dad at Bartram's Garden, where I work. What year was that going on? Oh, um, ah, oh, jeez, I don't know. Um, early 1800s is the best I can say. I'm not. That's really good enough. Remember I'm just wondering, seed. like the real general. Um, but like right around that time, um, people stopped being able to ever find it the Franklinia trees down there, it sort of disappeared and nobody's ever seen them in the wilds uh, in that area again. And Or anywhere else either? Well, not really. Um, it, it is extirpated, which means it disappeared from the wild and the only remaining um, survivors are um, descendants of the seedlings from the ones that the Bartrams um, grew at their nursery and stuff back in Philly. I thought I'd read this little passage. So I found this um, like amateur historian, ar archeologist. Um, he's a, a Creek man, Richard Thornton. And um, I found this article he wrote online and it really like inspired me to uh, think about the history of the Franklinia tree in a different way. Um, I'll just read a little section of it. So. It says, unfortunately, despite 
being the focus of some of the earliest colonial activities by European explorers, the Altamaha Basin has largely been ignored by archaeologists. Most of what we know about its Native American past comes from a few sketchy paragraphs by the chroniclers of Hernando de Soto and extensive discussions of the region by the French explorer René de Laudonnier in his memoir, Trois Voyages. So the meaning of the river's name. Altamaha is an anglicization of the Tamale place name, Al Tamal, uh, how. It means place of the merchant lord. Tamali was a language spoken in the coastal plain of Tamaulipas State, northeastern Mexico, next to Texas, until about 1250 AD. This language mixed Itzamaya, Totonic, Haustec, and some indigenous tongues. It appears to have been a trade jargon developed by uh, Contal Maya merchants, since Tama means to trade or buy in Totana. The name of that Tamal province was Am Ixchel, place of the fertility goddess, or Amachel in Spanish. Tamal Lepas means merchant people, place of. Sorry for bastardizing these words. I'm not really um, versed in speaking in the tongue of the Maya. So around 1250 AD, Chichimec or Coyote people, barbarians, swept through northeastern Mexico. Apparently, some of the refugees from Tamaulipas had not read late 20th century anthropology books. They violated federal law in 1250 AD by paddling their canoes for a few days up the Gulf Coast and becoming illegal aliens in the United States. When the Spanish arrived, on the Gulf Coast in the early 1500s. That was humor, by the way. The region between the mouth of the Mobile River in Alabama and the mouth of the Apalachicola River in Florida was also called Amichel, Amichel in Itzamaya. Apparently, remnants of Tamale or Tama people established colonies in several locations in the southeast. Their ethnic name came to be found in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, and Florida. And it goes on and on to talk about um, the past of that area being like a serious trade um, place for people from many different parts of the world. Um, like this, the Altima river basin appears to have been a melting pot where peoples of North America, Central America, and Caribbean basin and South America blended. This is also true for much of South Carolina and perhaps even the Southern Highlands. Um, so it, it goes into that. This is a really cool article by Richard L. Thornton. And, um, and um, it just made me think about um, the Franklinia as possibly being, you know, a cultivated plant uh, of ancient people. That was on that trade route. Yeah, that, and um, so, the, you know, it's so, it, it kind of adds to the mystery of the um, plant to me, which is already filled with a lot of mystery. And um, it's also like, just to tell you, it, it's a wonderful tea plant, and you can make a, caffe a lightly caffeinated green tea with it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of history of people, ancient people, um, using other North American plants for caffeine and, um, and also for, like, ritual and casual, like, um, tea ceremonies and stuff. So, um, yeah, such an interesting plant and very beautiful. In the July through September um, in Philadelphia, it's always covered in blossoms that are like, um, they look like um, eggs, sunny side up eggs. And they are just so cheerful and the bees are loving them. So as I've been um, in the habit of doing um, on my viral vlog, uh, every week I try to, I try to uh, highlight some artwork or music or or something you know some such thing done by um someone that i know someone that i that i personally know or is um you know in in my world uh you know 
who does some creative project or whatever that I'd like to draw attention to. And um, this week I'm actually going to do someone, uh, I'm going to do some, uh, highlight some artwork by somebody who um, unfortunately passed away um, December 2019. Uh, but um, was was part of a two-piece band uh, from a good friend of mine, Billy, uh, from Harrisonburg called Buck Gooder was the name of their band. Um, and Buck Gooder still continues on. Um, with with Billy as the as a solo project now, um, but uh, anyways, um, this person Terry Turtle was the uh, guitarist um, and and also singer um, as well in uh, Buck Gooder and um, you know various uh, of my bands played with their band um, over the years. I forget what the first show we played with them was, but it was well, it was many years back and. Um, we would we would go down to Harrisonburg and play shows with them often. Uh, me and Mandy's band too. Terry was um, I always like to say Terry was one of the you know handful of fans of our band, the Great Cackler. Uh, probably one of the one of the only three people who actually you know knew some of our songs <laughs> or something like that. Um, and um, yeah, and he was he was a really special person and super super creative. Um, and um, so yeah, I'm gonna. I was going through with my old box of some of my stuff, and came across a couple of his things. So I thought I would show those off. Um, so um, this uh, this is a piece of artwork of his that that I have um, that I found in my one of my boxes of old stuff here, um, and uh, he always laminated his art. Um, because he would sell it on tour with his band, so they, you know, they would play at a bar or in somebody's basement or something like that, and people would be spilling beer and things, and, uh, and Terry used to always say, oh, you know, I came up with this idea, I'd laminate these fuckers, you know, you can, you can spill a beer on them, you can throw them on the ground, whatever, you know, it's like they're, they're just indestructible, you know, so this is one of his laminated, um, pieces of artwork and uh i believe i might have traded him some art for this i'm not sure but anyway it's inscribed on the back it says to my friend justin from terry turtle january 14th uh, 2012 um the down the drain forest uh is the name of it uh so yeah that's a piece of artwork by him now um there was a, a little self-published book, uh, some of his art, The Nun and other pieces, that his friend Billy helped him put together. And, um, you know, it shows you a lot, a lot of other examples of his, um, of his artwork. Uh, so yeah, he's a brilliant musician as well as an artist. If you look up Buck Gooder, um, this is their, one of their tapes, um, that was a collaboration posthumous release of live recordings they did with a band that they toured with, A Place to Bury Strangers, but that's their band. That's Terry and Billy. Um, and, uh, yeah, so if you look up Buff Gooder, there's Terry. Uh, about the artist, Terry Turtle was born in Baltimore, Maryland. He's a poet and a musician. He's been involved with the industrial touring duo slash band Buff Gooder since 2005. Um... And, uh, yeah, so, that is, oh, I like this, this is one of my favorites of his, um, working in a collective, <laughs> so, um, I think Billy might have put out a second edition of this book, a second printing, and I'm not sure if that's sold out yet or not, um, but, uh, but if you look him up on the internet or look up Buck Gooder, you can certainly find more information um, without too much difficulty about the wonderful, incredible, talented Terry Turtle. God rest his soul. And Buck Gooder, um, which continues on. It's Frank Hurricane is another a musician. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to show that off, um, and I thought I would, I like to, I like to, um, talk about what I've been up to the past week, so this past week, I've really been, um, I've really been 
fixated on working on my nonfiction writing, the Mary Mowbray Clark biography. It's almost up to 500 pages now. Um, the end of her life is in 1962, and I'm carrying it up to 1921 for book one, because it's going to have to be a two-volume set, and I have no idea who would publish this crazy thing, but um, I've really been working on that. I just finished, I'm doing a chapter that's kind of about, she, um, she had an avant-garde bookstore that opened in 1916 in New York, and um, continued on until 1927, and so many interesting um, artists and intellectuals and writers and stuff, uh, you know, kind of got their start there or hung out there or whatever. So I just finished writing a little um, bit about Peggy Guggenheim. Uh, Mary had kind of inspired Peggy Guggenheim to become interested in the arts and stuff like that. So I write a little bit about that. And I've been writing about this um, Gilbert Kanan, who I had never heard of. Um, he's not an author people read any anymore or anything like that, but it's really he's a really interesting character. Um, he was kind of an up-and-coming author with D.H. Lawrence and stuff. He was from England, and um, his career kind of, uh, you know, um, was was cut short by his uh, developing schizophrenia, and he became uh, paranoid, you know, and stuff like that. And um, he was uh, palling around with Mary Mulberry Clark and spending time at her bookshop. Um, she published his uh, his next-to-last book, um, and I think his best probably his best work, but, um, and I have a copy of that, um, along with, uh, all of the, um, publications of her bookshop. Uh, they also did, they went into publishing a little bit, and, um, you know, so these are, these are all of the books that were published by the, the Sunwise Turn bookshop. Um, this, this little cover for this book is by this woman, Marion Dorn, um, one of their artist friends. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is all just, um, you know, their publications and stuff, but I really think that this book, Love is Less Than God by Gilbert Keenan, is um, not only probably my favorite, my favorite thing that he did, but it's probably... Um, it's probably my favorite publication um, from the Sunwise Turn Bookshop. So this was done around the time that he was um, that he was starting to become a little bit more um, psychologically fragile. Um, and uh, most of his books are like novels, um, and they're they're more or less autobiographical. But he changes the names. Um, and uh, this one is really not that way. It's like a long prose poem that just gets into like philosophy and abstractions. And um, for that reason, I just sort of prefer it. I think it's, you know, I, I could enjoy reading this. Um, and Mary mentions in her diaries that um, she uh, heard him read this um, first, uh, and then asked him if she could publish it after she heard him read it out loud, so, um, he became fixated on this symbol that he thought could fix all of the problems, cosmic problems in the world, um, and, um, you know, this is the book of the soul that, meeting its hour, has spoken the truth that has long been hidden. There is one truth. It is contained in these words. Go to me, my love, and be beloved. These words were wrought upon by the mind until their meaning is obscured, wherefore it is necessary to make them into a symbol of that which operates through all life here on earth or in any other part of the universe. The symbol is this. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's just some brilliant passages in this. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's, uh, yeah, it is to be noticed that this sentence begins and ends with the letter I. So do all sentences framed in the minds of the unawakened who remain, however long their lives, in a state of adolescence which may or may not be happy. Happiness is unimportant and belongs to children who alone know what to do with it. Um, so yeah, this is a... Uh, and all of these books, as far as I know, the binding... It's kind of this cloth binding with this pattern, and I and every uh, I've only ever seen one other instance of this book, and it had a completely different sort of binding. Um, 
you know, a different pattern leading me to think that they might have hand bound all of these at the at the bookshop. Um, and each one's a little different, which which is kind of a neat little collectible uh, element of it. Um, so yeah, I've just been working on my nonfiction writing, um, staying up to about five in the morning and just going totally crazy with it this week. These are all my notes, um, you know, for the uh, nonfiction for the Mary Mulberry Clark book. Um, then I have this little folder, you know. Uh, this is Mary Mulberry Clark's brother, Stephen Henry Horgan, the inventor of halftone printing. You know, one of her artist friends, um, Henry Fitch Taylor, oh, John Walcott Adams, and you know. So these are a lot of the books that um, I've been using as reference books. You know, um, just and of course, there's also all of the academic archives and um, other kind of archives. Of course, I've got all of these uh, many uh, boxes of, you know, things that I dug out of Mary Mulberry Clark's old abandoned house up in Rockland County, including artwork and textiles even. You know, this beautiful Ruth Reeves, uh, who's a textile artist, friend of hers. It's one of, an example of one of her textiles. Um, so, um, yeah. So that's, anyway, that's what I've been working on this week. That's just that, all that in a nutshell. Um, I could um, show off some of the, uh, you know, the unfinished draft of the thing. This is my um, Peggy Guggenheim chapter, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just, um... It's just, I'm about, uh, I'm getting to the point where I feel like I could tie up, um, the first book. You know, I, I'm thinking that if I get it to 550 pages or something, this is Gilbert Canaan's, um, medallion portrait by John Mulberry Clark, Mary Mulberry Clark's husband. He would do these little medallion portraits of their friends and stuff like that. Um. And that was, that's Gilbert Canaan when he was um, in law school. Uh, he lived in this windmill. Uh, the artist lived in this windmill. Um, and uh, that was kind of his life before he came to the United States and got involved in this unwise turn and all of this stuff like that. Um, so anyway. That's Gilbert Canaan and some of my nonfiction writing I've been working on. I think maybe we'll do a musical segment. Um, we've got a couple of bands we'd like to present to you this week on Viral Vlog, and then we'll say our goodbyes. Anton, are you ready to rock out? Okay. America's favorite fat cat, are you ready to rock out? As ready as I'll ever be. Are you guys all ready to rock? Yeah! How about you guys? Yeah! <laughs> Hello everybody, we're called Planned Federal Response and this song is called Shelter in Place, Don't Touch Your Face. Watch out Faith!
note that this um, beautiful piece of artwork by Katie Kaplan, Philadelphia artist, is um, called Queen of My Own Castle, I believe. Also known as Penny Smasher, one of our favorite artists. And we are the Great Cackler, and this is our song, Rivers of Moonlight. This has been Viral Vlog, Episode 6. This song is dedicated to the Green Heron. so much for watching. This has been Viral Vlog episode 6, the sixth week of our um, pandemic, global pandemic lockdown. Um, it is Friday, April 24th, and we will see you all next week. Goodbye, everybody. I love you.